Hi guys, welcome to the Advanced Refrigeration Training Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Compass, along with my partner, Brett Wetzel. Today's episode is sponsored by Westermeyer Industries, the leaders in oil management and presser vessels for the commercial refrigeration industry. Whether you're involved with designing a system or tasked with servicing one, Westermeyer Industries has been helping meet the needs of customers like you for the past 20 years. They offer a broad catalog of stock system components with an in-house team of engineers to assist with custom solutions as well. From oil separators and heat exchangers to system monitoring devices, Westermeyer Industries are a total system specialist with industry expertise, engineering know-how, and the manufacturing muscle to help you tackle problems and deliver solutions. What do you got going on this week, Kev? Where are you at? Uh, In the middle of nowhere in Wisconsin, doing EMS upgrades. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing exciting. It's probably the most boring stuff ever. (laughs) I'm going to be sitting in the classroom for the next two days. We uh, we have our and they're doing uh, tra- uh, training for their uh, RDM stands for Resource Data Management. Uh, it's basically a company out of Scotland, and some uh, a lot of customers are, are basically going. Um, problem is is you know not so much the programming on the controller portion. It's knowing what the customer wants. You know, you, there's a hundred different ways to control. 100 different ways to control a um, refrigerator, uh, like a medium temp box, you know, whether it has electric defrost. But, you know, we need to know whether we're utilizing the mechanical control in the unit or if we're actually utilizing, you know, the actual controller to work to its full capability and have it control, you know, everything about the fans and everything like that. Uh, one call that I, we went to go do today, it was it tries to maintain superheat off of a coil in coil out temperature. Uh, this was done years ago with uh, Emerson's uh, CPC, CC100, where they actually had a coil temperature sensor on the distributor lines and a temperature sensor on the suction line. And it worked great, you know, because I, I guess they didn't realize how, you know, how expensive it would be to have pressure transducers for every single system or maybe didn't have the capability at that point when those controllers came out. And now they're starting to implement this, you know, with other systems. Problem is that inlet temperature has to be on the actual distributor line, um, not actually on the, the, uh, the piece between the DXV and the actual nozzle, which we found out today. Um, we, we, you know, relocated it today and we a certain manufacturer had sent all these cases out, not installed properly. So now we have to figure out what we're going to do but um i want to thank you guys uh we're up to about 2100 downloads um you know we, we, we couldn't have done that without you guys uh we appreciate you guys listening in um we're working on trying to do some sort of q a um i started a facebook group um, advanced refrigeration podcast so look it up uh, please like it um, we're going to start uh trying to do some type of q a where you guys can ask any questions you guys want and, you know, we'll help you with, you know, any kind of issues that you do have. Um, we will have a regular schedule with that. We're still working out the details, but it is in the works and it is coming. Kevin, you want to start us off with what we're talking about? So today we wanted to go over uh, what what's going to be more than likely a couple part episode on oil management. So oil controls, uh, oil separators, compressor oil stuff. So basically we're going to go over the whole oil uh, set up on the rack the, in piece by piece and build it up. And then eventually we'll get to uh, more troubleshooting stuff. But we're going to go over like on this episode more so at uh, the beginning pieces of the, the whole puzzle, oil separators, the oil system, the valves, how everything works, what to kind of look out for, and then how each individual oil separator works. So with that being said, we're going to dive right into it. Why do we need an oil separator? So we basically need an oil separator, oil management system, 
because we have unequal uh, compressor cycling loads and runtime with compressors. So we are moving refrigerant around a massive area. So we need to keep try to keep that oil in one spot. That one spot needs to be at the, at the rack, obviously. So the more oil we keep in the rack, the better off we are. We're not logging in cases. We're not causing oil slugs. So if we keep the oil at the rack in the compressors and in the oil separator, we're going to be much better off. So that that's the basic reason why we have an oil separator. So we have unequal compressors capacities. We have unequal run times and all compressors wear different rates. So they're all going to be moving oil at different rates. So every one of those compressors is, has a different uh, oil flow that they're, they're pumping around a little bit slightly. They shouldn't be pumping a lot of oil or you have problems. So every one of those compressors is going to need makeup oil at one point. It's just not going to get enough oil coming back from the system in order to, to, to feed that compressor at all times. It's going to need to rely on the oil management system. So that is the brief reason why we need oil system, an oil system. Brett, you want to add anything to that? No, you got it pretty well covered. Um, we do have um, basically two different types of uh, compressors that actually pump oil or I'm sorry, lubricate different ways, right? We have a conventional compressor uh, that we all hold tried and true. W Hermetic, which basically has a, uh, an oil pump that's connected to the, the crankshaft that's driven by the electric motor. That's basically picking up oil from the bottom of the, of the sump, driving the oil into the uh, crankshaft and distributing it through the connecting rods to the piston to make sure everything's all lubricated. We have another style, which if anyone's ever worked on a small K body, they're familiar with it's cling compressor. Basically it has almost like a... Uh, Color in, in the towards the front of the compressor. It basically has that crank is rotating. It's actually uh, sloshing that oil around and lubricating, uh, you know, every bit of that compressor. Um, Bitzer also makes a twin style compressor. Um, it it look it doesn't. There's basically like three different types of, of bits. There's one that has a, a, an oil pump that extrudes almost like a Copeland. It's you know steps farther out. The other one. Uh, looks almost like the sling style compressor except for it still has a plus and minus terminal on there to represent crankcase pressure and oil pressure and then we also have the sling compressor the sling compressor uh they use a lot with um they use a lot with vfds because the slower you move the crankshaft the less oil you're going to create the sling compressor basically still can lubricate well with moving at a lower rpm so you will see that um, on the bigger on the bigger racks that that utilize uh, VFD driving that that particular compressor. The three types of separators that we do have, um, basically, when the compressor is uh, pumping oil into the crank, into up into the pistons, you know it, it's mixing this with the with the, with the refrigerant. So, like Kevin said, we want it to be oil centralized to the rack. So we have separators. We have a helical separator, which is CFM based. Um, basically, if we're not CFM enough, uh, compression, or I'm sorry, enough CFM through the discharge to keep that uh, oil slinging out of that of that uh, oil separator, it's not going to be able to separate the oil. We also have what's called a tension screen style separator that has screens in there as well as a, a little baffle in there to, to help the oil separate out. And the last one is we have a filtered style or a, a coalescing filter. Um, these are the most efficient. They're not, they are still CFM based, but they have a lot more, you know, where a basic a helical separator it might only, if it's rated for, let's just say 30 CFM, it might only be efficient where it actually still separates oil maybe down at uh, 15, 20 CFM, where an, uh, I'm sorry, a coalescing filter, uh, you might be able to go, if it's rated for 30 CFM, you might be able to go all the way down to two CFM on a real low load situation and still, you know, expel the amount of, the amount of oil 
back into the system so we don't send that oil out into out into our cases because we don't want to going out there i mean we still you know design wise we still design our supermarkets to be able to trap oil and return oil in case you know something were to happen that being said um you know the more oil you trap out in the system uh the less efficient your a lot of your coils are going to are going to function right it, really the only lo- thing that's supposed to be in that in those coils is refrigerant so if you're loading a whole bunch of these coils with oil you know you're, you're basically taking up some of the surface area internally and then not getting the thermal exchange needed to you know to actually refrigerate whatever you're trying to control anything you want to add yeah one so like one thing especially with like helicoil separators i mean you the lower the load gets especially when you start reducing the head pressure with a helicoil separator you're going to start reducing your uh flow rates to that separator a lot and then you end up start separating less oil like you said so one thing i've been seeing a lot of customers do to combat that and i've done it too is we purposely undersize helicoil separators so by that we i mean you may have a, a system with you know say 90 cfm of compressor and it has a 60 CFM or like a, you know, 75 CFM separator on it. So like I, I have a couple racks where we went from two and an eighth down to inch and three or two and an eighth down to inch and an eighth and then blew it back up. So we did that because we figured the actual load, the evaporator load of the rack where a lot of people end up oversizing a helicoil separator and it's a terrible thing to do because now your your separation rate is so low. So we end up doing that, and then we keep our separation rates higher. We end up with a little bit of a pressure drop in the summer, but that ends up, you know, we end up separating more oil so all summer and winter long. So it ends up being extremely better for us in the long run. Uh, we got the different types of oil systems we have. We have low and uh, high pressure. I'll, I'll take that one. So a high pressure oil system is uh, a separator reservoir combo, meaning the separator also has the reservoir and the oil is stored at the bottom of the separator. Now you could have a helicoil or you could have a uh, uh, filtered oil separator. They can both be high pressure oil systems. So you have a separated reservoir combo. You can sometimes have a separate reservoir on the side of the rack, depending on uh, uh, what the manufacturer did or how much oil. You sometimes you see that in scroll racks. So that a high pressure oil system is delivering high pressure oil to. I would consider a high pressure oil system to be straight high pressure right to the device. I mean, would you agree with that, Brett? Like. To an OMB. Yeah, well, no, I, I, there'd be two types of high pressure pretty much. I've seen that. it both ways. So, like, you know, like you can see a high, it'll label it has a high pressure system and it's still considered a high pressure yeah. system, even though it's going to an oil rack valve. You know what I mean? Um, and it's yeah. still, considered- I mean, a true high pressure system to me would be like uh, an OMB. Yeah, or like an oil system for like a transcritical rack, where basically you have pressure yeah. still going to whatever's filling up your compressor. And the reason why we do that yeah. is because most of the devices that actually fill the oil in, uh, you know, are ported. So basically, you know, it's not shooting a, a large sum of oil at one big shot into that compressor. Yes, correct. So that a high pressure oil system could have regulating valve or could not. I mean, it could be just a straight to electronic oil control, or it could be to a pressure reducing valve. Now, with a high-pressure oil system, you're going to need a pressure-reducing valve if you're using standard floats. So, like a Sporlin Y123 valve or a Hussman, it's a Y, uh, yeah, A25. It's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, the A25 was like the original version of the Y123. So, that's Hussman's version. Sporlin makes it for them. You can change it out to an A20 or a Y123 and it'd be fine and probably honestly a little bit more reliable. Um, but they're using that pressure reducing valve. It's measuring 
outlet pressure of that valve minus the suction pressure to keep a differential, usually anywhere from 18 pounds to 30 pounds of differential on the oil line to feed your oil pots. So that would be a high pressure oil system. Now, we also will go over this real quick. A truly true high pressure oil system would be like on a screw compressor where you're just flowing oil right out of the separator. You have a solenoid valve. It's just injecting oil straight into the compressor. But we're injecting into the rotors all the time. I mean, it could be a 5 eighths or a 7 eighths line, depending on how big the screw is, of just oil circulating into that compressor. So that would also be a high pressure oil system. But they're using no oil control whatsoever besides a solenoid valve to stop start flow. Let me let me add something onto that. Um, I spent about five years working on industrial uh -huh. screws, and and basically the reason why is the clearance on a screw on a, a true blue male and female rotor screw um, is very very close. But you need to basically complete compression, so they actually utilize the oil in order to complete the compression process to basically seal it off. Um, and because you're, you're, you're basically injecting that much volume of oil, you know, and it's, it's going directly into the discharge, you're creating copious amounts of heat. And that's why a lot of times on screw systems, you, you will have some, especially on low temp, um, because you have a higher ratio, you will have uh, some sort of oil cooling device, whether it's going into an oil cooler that's separate that looks almost like a condenser. If you have an evaporative condenser, a lot of times they'll have a separate feed for an oil cooler line that's actually going into the um, into the evaporative condenser to help bring down that oil temperature. Yes, yeah, you see it a lot with screws. I mean, it's very important. And the, is the and also cooler. the eight twenty five. If no one knows what they look like, um, it basically looks like an expansion valve, um, except for the fact that the power head is actually connected to the outlet of the valve. And that's because that's, you know, helping uh, regulate what pressure you're actually going out. Uh, the reason why we have to regulate that pressure on a lot of our systems that have regular conventional oil floats, uh, Sporlin, Sporlin's uh, differential, they'll go from anywhere from 5 to 90 pound differential, which means you can run, you know, 5 to 90 pounds higher than what suction that you're running. Um, be mindful that's not every single oil float on the market. Um, Henry makes, there's, I think, one or two model numbers where they only allow a max of a, of a 30 pound differential. So be mindful of that because if your differential is too high, um, you could potentially damage your oil level controls or what I refer to, and you guys can make fun of me, the oil pots on the side of the compressors. Um, you know, basically, you know, to let that oil in, if that, if that differential is too high, you will actually damage it. And then potentially it either will overfill all the time or clamp down and not let any oil in. Yeah. So next we're going to go over low pressure oil system. So a low pressure oil system is an oil system that is utilizing a Oil separator it could be a centrifugal, it could be a uh, impingement style, or it could be a filtered style separator that has a float on the bottom of it. When the float, when the separator separates enough oil, and the float fills up, it, the float lifts up the the ball inside there, lifts up, picks up a needle, and then oil flows through the po needle port through there comes out of the separator through a copper line. It could hit a uh, strainer or a filter, depending on how you have it set up. And there should be a sight glass there. And then it should come out of there and it should dump into the top of your oil reservoir. Now you're gonna have, you have, with a low pressure oil system, you need an oil reservoir. So you need somewhere to store that oil. So then that oil reservoir, on the bottom has a port that you connect your oil line to that could either have a filter on it or no, fil no filter, depending on which way you have your, uh, your filter set up on the inlet to the or reservoir or the outlet. And then that line is going to be feeding all your oil pots. Now, the way you get the differential and the way you get it so you can flow oil into this, into this uh, reservoir is you have what's called an OCV. So this OCV valve is a spring-loaded check valve. 
Sporlin makes them. They come in a, a 5, a 10, a 20, and a 30. Do they come in a 15? I've never seen never. a 15. I've never seen a 5. Yeah, I've never seen <laughs> Yeah. I've seen 5s a lot with uh, power gotcha. coolers, compressors. But, uh, yeah, so they come in a 5, a 50, or a 20, a 10, and a 30. So what this is doing is this is a spring-loaded check valve pointing back towards the suction line. So it goes back to your suction header. And what happens is as your oil leaves the oil separator, it's at high pressure, it starts filling up the tank. Well, as it gets to whatever that valve setting is, is it say it's an OCV20 and your suction pressure is 40 pounds. So as soon as that tank gets to 60 pounds, as soon as it gets higher than that, it starts, it opens the spring loaded check valve and it starts venting off towards the suction for two reasons. Because we need, we need to maintain that set oil pressure, like Brett said earlier, because those floats can only handle so much and we're trying to keep a steady level in there. And two, we need to create flow in order to get the oil out of the separator into the reservoir. Otherwise, it would just deadhead with pressure and not drain out of the reservoir or out of the separator into the reservoir. Yeah. Think yeah, about it this way. Different. You know, we basically need to go, you know, remember, you know, refrigeration is basically based off going from high to low pressure, right? So if we don't have that high to low pressure or high to lower pressure, we're never going to have any flow. You know, you know, we talked about hot defrost, you know, that's the reason why we need the DDR or the OLDR. We need the differential to have that flow. Same principle with the low pressure system, right? So, for example, you know, we might be running 200 pound uh, head pressure, right? So that that 200 pound head pressure is going into the oil separator. Uh, the oil, uh, the, the ball valve at the bottom opens up, lets the needle, lets the needle open up, delivers the basically discharge pressure into the reservoir. Now, when that happens, you know, like Kevin said, the OCV will then open up um, and that OCV, just be mindful, is piped into the highest suction. Okay, I'll get there in a second. But we're piped in the highest suction. So let's just say our highest suction is 40 PSI. Um, we have an OCV 20 on there. So like you said, you know, we have approximately 50 pounds of, of pressure in our reservoir now. Well, if our suction pressure is at 40 pounds, that also means that our compressor crankcases are at 40 pounds. So we basically have three pressures, right? We have our discharge pressure. We then have an intermediate pressure, which is the, you know, the, the reservoir pressure, which is basically suction plus whatever the OCV value is. And then we have our crankcase or suction pressure going back to our compressor. So we basically have, you know, two different step downs that we're achieving in order to keep flow from the oil separator to the oil reservoir to finally the compressor to make sure we have some happy compressors. So one big thing with uh, the OCVs is I see a lot of times is uh, guys will condemn them when there's nothing wrong with them because they'll see the reservoir is not at like 20 pounds over suction. And then there's actually a problem somewhere else in the system. So the way to test a low pressure OCV is what you do is you close off the outlet to the tank you take your discharge, your hose, you put it on the top, top feeder line, they going in from the separator and you're going to pressurize it with discharge gas. And that thing, that tank should hold, you know, whatever it is, 20 or 10 or 30 pounds above whatever the, uh, whatever the set point is on that check valve. If it bleeds down right away, like instantly, your check valve's bad or it's stuck. You're going to need a new one. If it holds and holds steady, your problem's not with the OCV. It's with the separator actually feeding pressure into the OC or into the tank. It's not separating enough oil. Well, when you oh, just let me elaborate. So when he's talking about holding steady, he's talking about holding steady, you know, 20 or 30 pounds above suction. If you pressurize that with discharge gas, still with the OCV active and still with the OCV heading towards the suction line, that, that service valve is open actually end up putting you know let's just say 150 pounds in there and it goes up to 150 now you do not have the problem where it's you know opening too far now you basically have where it's shot where there might be some kind of debris blocking the ball um this usually happens when when people overcharge systems and you have copious amounts of oil the brim of the of the oil reservoir 
And basically, you got dirty oil, especially if you have oil filter on the outlet of your reservoir, where basically the you know the system's overcharged with oil because we kept having oil failures, so we keep filling it up with oil. Which obviously, I'm you know I'm joking. That's not the correct thing to do, but you know that that can happen. So not only can it also it can stick open, but it can also stick shut. And if you once and if we don't have I, that differential, if we don't have the discharge to the intermediate pressure. Basically, your oil separator can fill up with oil and be jammed full. And because you don't have, basically, you have now 200 pounds at your discharge discharge separator and also your reservoir, there is no flow. Once again, we go from high to low. We don't have the high to low. It's a no-go. It doesn't flow. Yes. And then uh, the other thing to watch out for, like I've seen, like you talked about, that, that, that being all the way full is you won't feed you won't have enough feed pressure inside that tank if the if the ball and the and the float is actually not up feeding discharge gas in there all the time if that tank is all the way full you don't have that buffer pressure in there to help push that oil into that compressor you you're just going to have whatever's in that tank pressure and as soon as the tank pressure runs out you're done whatever the oil pressure is in there, you need that buffer on top there. You don't want that top ball to be full because you need that buffer in that tank. Agreed. Now, what I was talking about before, uh, just to elaborate, because I kind of skimmed over real brief because I wanted to get the thought out. Um, but basically, you know, if we have a dual temp header, right, so we're basically where I'm saying where we have low temp compressors and medium temp compressors on, you know, on our rack. They're obviously split by a header. Um, so let's just say we're running 10 pounds on one and 40 pounds on another. Um, I had stated before that we want to make sure the OCV is actually piped into the highest suction. Um, this is the reason why. Let's, let's for example, um, let's just, OCV 30 is hooked up to the plus 10, or, you know, basically the 10 pound suction header. All right. So if oil reservoir pressure is basically our OCV plus our suction pressure, if we have an OCV 30, that gives us a reservoir pressure of 40 PSI. If our medium temp is also running at 40 PSI, once again, now we do not have that difference in pressure of the oil reservoir being higher than the suction. So yes, we will feed oil to our better, um, compressors, but we will not feed oil to our lower temp, I'm sorry, our higher temp header. Because now basically the oil, the oil pressure in the reservoir at that point would be 40 pounds. And once again, our suction pressure would be 40 pounds, so there's no flow. So once again, we want to always hook up, if we have a dual temp header, we want to hook up to the highest suction. So this is actually what would happen then if we had it hooked up correctly. If you had the OCV 30, you're hooked up to the uh, 40 pound suction. Now you would have your expected pressure of inside your uh, reservoir to be about 70 pounds. Now, so seven, so we're going from 200 to 70, you know, down to 40. So we got the two step downs to get into the actual crankcase of the compressor. Now, because we still have, uh, 70 pounds in our reservoir, that's obviously greater than 10 PSI. So now we can still feed oil to both now our low temp and our medium temp header. And that's why we're, we're connected to the higher, uh, the higher pressure header. Yeah. I mean, that, that's why a high pressure oil system, to be honest, is so much better for a dual temp application, just for the simple fact that, you can have two different oil regulating valves on there and you can set each oil regulating valve, you know, 20 to 30 pounds above. So that way you don't have one header with 55 pounds of oil, that oil pressure and one header of, you know, 12 pounds of that oil pressure. So, I mean, that's why, in my opinion, using a high pressure oil system in that application ends up being a lot more smooth and having a lot more uh, quality oil levels than, uh, what you just described because with a, with a standard oil, low, low pressure oil system. Okay. You want to head over, um, how to properly set an oil, uh, oil float? Yeah. All right. So this is like probably one of my biggest pet peeves is I see guys cranking on floats all the time when they have oil issues. So, an oil float is a very simple device, all right? It's a needle in a seat, basically, much like a carburetor. So 
there is a needle and a seed in there. As you drive that in, you drive that valve closed. So there's a C clip on here. This, or uh, no, yeah, when you drive it at closed, you can. Two things you got to watch out for. When you drive it all the way closed, you got to be careful so you don't crush the ball. Once you feel it get tight, you stop. Because you keep going, you're going to end up crushing the ball. And then likewise, when you back it all the way out, it's usually like a spore line. I think it's 10 turns uh, all the way out. You want to watch because you, there's a C-clip on there. And if you go too tight, it'll break the C-clip off. And then it'll just sit there and turn. So it's two things you got to watch out for. Is you don't want to make sure you don't crush it. And you want to make sure you don't turn it. Now, when I'm looking at oil floats, there is one way to set an oil float. And that is off the chart. Henry, Sporlin, it doesn't matter man, 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 the manufacturer, anybody who makes oil floats lists a differential chart. Now, the way this chart works is down one side you have a number of turns, and another side you have uh, PSID the, uh, from suction to oil line feed pressure. So that's your PSID. So say it's say you want to maintain half a site glass. So you look at the half a site glass, and then you look at the you know, 20 pound PSID, and where they intersect, that's gonna tell you how many turns open or closed you need to be. That is how I set my oil floats every time. And if I got oil floats that are like all over the place and this and that, and I know my differential is good, and all that's good, the first thing I'm gonna go through and do is I'm gonna go recheck all the oil separators or, or sorry, the, all the floats on the compressors. I'm going to run them all the way down, and then I'm going to run them back to where they, they need to be, what the chart says. And then I'll come back like a day or two later and see how everything le leveled out. If I got compressors that are full to the top and uh, others that won't feed, yeah, I probably got an oil float issue or it's coming down the suction line. But trying to adjust an oil float while it's running by like tweaking it is the wrong way to do it. I mean, on startups, like I'll set all my oil floats before I even start to rack. And then I know if I got oil floats that are overfeeding or like filling up 100%, I know I got an issue with that oil flow. <laughs> you could set an oil flow while everything's sitting static just by the, counting the number of turns. I've been doing it the wrong way. <laughs> I, what you're saying is the absolute right way to do it. Um, but. I, I do it the, the the bad way. Where basically, I um, if I if I like I just I literally just had a rack uh, last week where every single oil level was all the way to the top. You know, um, basically what you should do in that point where you have that's the oil level and all your compressor is pump out the oil. Now, you, you know, unless you have unless you have a separator that's filled to the brim, uh, basically you want to go up back. And the reason why you want to do that is because POE oil is extremely expensive. And, you, you know, we want to make sure that we still do have enough adequate oil level in the reservoir to make sure that we still feed all the compressors. But in this this instance, I had every single oil uh, float that was filled to the brim. They shut off all the compressors and waited for them to come down. If you want to hurry up this process, you can actually hook up the gauge from, your, uh, from the positive side of the oil pump, basically where the oil pressure is going to be. And dump it into, and basically pump it into then the rest. Um, this is better than dumping in the suction because you know basically if you're dumping in the suction while you're trying to adjust your oil levels, you're now adding oil to the to the header, which means it's going to end up in the compressor. So yes, you're trying, you know, you're trying to set the oil level while you're trying to do this, and basically you might pour oil in there thinking that the oil level control is malfunctioning when in reality you're just getting the abundance of oil that you now you pumped in the suction rather than the reservoir so that's why i usually pump it into the reservoir um i drain them all the way down uh and the reason why i do this is to act the oil fail control um i'd rather test the oil fail control while it's in front of me than have the compressor fail because i didn't test the oil fail control and then the compressor goes bad but basically i drain it all the way down test the oil fill control, make sure it is in fact going to fail. And then once I do this, um, you know, uh, basically I, I, you know, open up the oil line back up and uh, starting from the lowest position, you know, fill it up to, to, to the position um, that the compressor is needed. 
some compressors only need an eighth of a glass. Some compressors, you know, they call for a minimum of three eighths. You know, you have to be mindful with oil oil control because, I mean, a higher level oil and what the compressor is actually calling for can cause catastrophic damage. Carlisle's are notorious for this. Um, they're very tall compressors. They have a very uh, long crankshaft. And too high, it splashes that oil around and potentially causes valve damage. So as we all know, compressors can't compress liquid, so the sure as hell can't compress, you know, liquid oil. It'll do the same amount of damage as, as you know, floodback will do to a compressor. Except double the mess. Yeah, to say that. Especially when it, especially when it <laughs> blows up the head gasket. It's like a 360-degree, like, just oil, you know. I haven't had one blow, blow out like that. Um, I have. One, I've had it. I had one car, uh, one car out that looked like a washing machine inside the side glass. It was it, so much oil uh, filled up inside that it was it was literally a washing machine. And I had a old Worthington compressor. I have a picture of it. The oil fail control was <laughs> not working. And when I showed up, this was a belt driven compressor. When I showed up on site, the compressor was still running but the crank and everything the crank the valve was basically gone the crank was just held on there and all the connecting rods were basically spun over because they got bent because it just kept running oil fill control didn't work either did the low pressure switch yeah the compressors we change out at this uh co2 store uh was it last week on wednesday or thursday and Friday, uh, I think we drained like two and a half gallons out of each one. Little tiny baby bitters, they were full to the heads, like they they were coming out. It mm-hmm. was coming out of the uh, service valves. We took it off. Yeah, M- needless to say, the uh, rods were snapped. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then we started with that. Um, one thing I I want to I want to you know caution you guys about or what, what you said about pumping the oil I do the exact same, but please pay attention when the oil control should be tripping and you see the oil pressure dropping off or it's been red for a while. I we were doing a gas changeover one time and I had an apprentice working with me doing that you know draining out the oil and you know putting it in a bucket and we were draining it out and we're getting ready to do a you know clean the sump screen and uh, seal up the compressor. And he got, you know, distracted. Five minutes went by. <clears throat> oil control was jumped out. And needless to say, we burned up a 4D compressor. So just be mindful when you're doing that. Just pay attention. And like it, like Brett said, you know, try to pump it back in the reservoir so it's not coming out of suction. If you have a dual temp rack and you can't pump it in the reservoir, like say um, you you have nowhere to put it or it's a dual temp rack, I'll try to pump it in the other header so that way it's not coming down the suction. Whatever one that you're not you. using at that point in time. So if you're trying to adjust oil level controls on the low temp, yeah. pump it in the medium temp. As long as the oil is greater I, than the pressure that you're trying to dump into. But I, I employ you guys to everybody to look at the, the charts from Sporlin and Henry. They all, they all have it. That's how I set my oil controls. And I've been doing it like this for a long time. I would tell you, like I find very rarely that I got to tweak them down or up a little bit. They're usually pretty much dead nuts on there. Um, So you want to go over the OMB yeah. real quick? Since we went over, we went over Absolutely. The OMB mode. control is basically a, a, a controller made by Emerson. And yep. has three lights on. One light is green for everything's good, everything's right with the world. We have a good oil level, not trying to fill. We have a fill light, which is yellow. And then we have a red light, which is uh, has alarmed out. Um, basically, you know, this is a oil level control. Um that is, you know, has a, a certain, uh, you know, that's set for a certain level. There's no adjustment on this. Um, basically, what happens is, you know, they typically the sling style that I was referring to uh, earlier, 
Um, and they do use them on uh, regular compressors that also have oil uh, oil pumps in them. You know, a lot of times they do use them for slings or scrolls. Basically, the oil level dips down. Um, there's a, a ball with a lever in there. Basically, electronically tells the control, hey, I'm low on oil. Uh, yellow light will, will turn on, which is the fill light. Uh, this will energize also at the same time as that light as a, with a solenoid. Try to bring the oil level back up. Uh, if it does not uh, bring up within a certain amount of time, it will fail. When it fails, it shuts down the compressor control circuit, and basically will the red light will be on, uh, indicating that you have, in fact, had a failure. What is the, because um, I'm not sure, I'd be lying if I told you, what is the uh, alarm time that typically it tries to, you know, fill up in X amount of time? You know, when will it alarm? Uh, Brad, you want to, so you want to talk about the brass sleeve in there which is seems to get missed a lot here lately and before that brass that brass extension on the omb that has to be in there when that when it's used on a scroll it has to be in there to move move that sensing spot farther into that compressor so that way it's not getting splashed with oil and there's really it's causing nuisance oil trips if that's not in there on a scroll It'll cause nuisance oil trips. It'll cause high oil levels and low oil levels. And then one thing I want to go over is uh, I haven't seen one in a really long time, but there was a set of Copeland compressors that, uh, man, I'm trying to remember the model number. I think it was like, uh, they were ZB uh 46s maybe but they were uh, they had a weird like number on them and these compressors so we started up these like protocol type kaiser racks and every medium temp compressor had non-stop oil trips like non-stop oil trips i mean we did everything with these compressors changed omb's uh you know, guys were coming in saying that, I mean, I started the store up and it randomly started happening. Guys were saying it was stuff was piped wrong. Construction department came in and fixed piping. Uh, guys were saying that Kaiser piped the oil header wrong. It needed to be, the oil header needed to be changed. We changed the entire oil header on one of these compressors. Finally, I got a hold of somebody at Copeland Engineering and there was this bulletin that wasn't an AE bulletin, but there was this bulletin for this particular compressor model number. So when used with an OMB had to have another extension on that brass piece. And a, it looked like they drilled, took a quarter and drilled a hole in it and inserted the brass, the original brass piece through this quarter to block the OMB. Because I guess what was happening is the way they designed this compressor, the motor was sitting down lower in the sump so when it was running it was causing like uh the oil to be so like move around so volatile in the bottom the omb just kept filling and filling and filling even though the compressor was full of oil it just kept filling and filling and filling it like it didn't see it because like the way it was uh it was causing the oil to flow around the bottom of the compressor it was affecting the omb so i mean there was i mean probably 40 50 hours on some of these tickets like guys looking at this stuff and it ended up being like a five dollar <laughs> kit from emerson and i mean i i pulled my hair out for days on this until we finally got a hold of the right person at emerson that uh had this kit and that that was ended up being the fix for it i've yet to see another one of those compressors i mean i'm assuming they redesigned it because it had issues but that was a, a huge issue with that. And it ended up being like an extent longer extension in there. Is that that thing being like, yeah. what, like two and a half, maybe three inches. I mean, it ended up being like that's five insane. inches. I've, ne I've never even heard of that. That's, that's, that's crazy. Yeah. I mean, it, it was, it was a complete nightmare and it was only on these compressors, like these bigger compressors in there. They were the only ones that were trim. Um, what else are we going over? Um, so let's go over. Uh, 
it's a moose. So how to identify a well, let's back up on that. Let's let's go over load management with the oil. So one big thing I want to go over is I see this a lot where guys are dumping oil and stuff or they have erratic oil levels. So one big thing is if your load is not steady and your compressor cycling is not steady and you're you're going to have terrible load co- or oil control because you need constant volume going through that oil separator to separate and depending on what kind of separator you have you know it, it may be you know more volume or less volume so one big thing i see i see guys driving down suction pressures and that tends to make oil problems worse because as you drive down suction pressures your velocities get lower and you get worse oil return you get eprs cranked down more you know they're, they're holding back more because now the suck rack suction pressure is lower and the eprs are set higher or you have cds valves in the store and they're more closed you get this you get this low mass flow and you get this short cycling at the rack of rapid pump outs the less you cycle a compressor every time that compressor starts it's moving a ton of oil out of it you move more oil out on a start than it does you know when it's running for a prolonged uh, short time every time you start that compressor that that action of starting you end up moving oil so you want to try to keep those compressors from starting and you want to try to keep your load steady and once you get everything steady and your head pressure is good, your oil return will be much better and you'll be able to manage your oil much better because you'll be separating more because your flow through the separator is more constant. So that, that, that is a big part of it. And then I see racks with like compressors cycling 200 times a day. You're pumping tons of oil out. You want, you want to try to reduce that. You get your suction pressures up and get everything optimized and, and good, you'd be surprised about how much oil return you have. That, and I see a lot of plug suction filters the guys overlook. I mean, you plug suction filters, you get that drop on there, all that oil sitting in that header, and then you get really poor oil return through those compressors. So one of the things I do want to say is to make sure that we don't have that sort of, you know, oil slug coming back. We, you know, we do have poor oil control where basically some of the oil gets out into the system. Uh, they, they, most manufacturers take measures to make sure that you have uh, slower oil return so you don't actually take out a compressor. 99.9% of suction line accumulators, um, if anyone's ever seen the inside, they basically have a, a candy cane uh, going from the outlet coming back up, you know, which doesn't allow liquid to flow directly to the out to the compressors. But at the bottom of the candy cane, there's usually a, a one eighth to uh, one eighth one eighth hole drilled at the bottom, and that's basically to meter not only liquid but also oil. Um, and a lot of suction headers, if they're bottom fed, where basically you have the header above where the compressors are, uh, the suction stub up coming out of the compressor going into the header will basically stick up probably uh, about an inch and a half. And then right where, right when the pipe goes through inch and a half, right before the weld on the, the pipe, there'll be, once again, another hole drilled. Once again, that's for both things. That's for liquid return, um, you know, so it slowly meters it through so it doesn't totally flood out your compressor. But also, majorly, it's for uh, oil return. And then there are some manufacturers where the compressors are actually piped on the top of the, uh, the, top of the header. And basically what they'll have is they usually have a separate line, uh, whether it be a nine or a three eighths line that's pulling the oil off the bottom of the header, um, going back into the suction of that compressor. Um, that's so we don't get, you know, copious in the, uh, in the suction header and then basically take our, out our compressors like uh, Kevin had last week. Yeah. I mean, there was a, a good picture on Facebook floating around of like the inside header uh, where they somebody had cut a, cut apart a header and you could see inside. Yeah, I'll give credit where credit's due. That's Michael's. Yeah. Yeah. 
that's exactly who it was. Yeah, that that's a good picture. I per- personally prefer Pipe up the top. I I think you you they protect the compressors a little bit better from oil slugs when they're piped off the top than vice versa off the bottom. I've seen the husband where they pipe them on the bottom and the, the header fills up with oil and or we go to cut in on, on a new construction or on a remodel we go to drill into a header and it's got been there. An inch and a half and of standing oil in there. Trying to weld a new stub in an oil yeah, laden I mean, header isn't really yeah. a fun thing to do. Yeah, real good, uh, real good trick. Uh, <laughs> vacuum cleaner, piece of half inch soft copper. Suck it right out of there. Um, so yeah, that that's that's one thing to be you know courteous about. Like, make sure you like take take it, you know. A look at that, and make sure your suction filters are good. I don't know how many times I, I, we took over a chain last year that from another contractor, and we were pulling suction filters. I mean, they are black as tires, and every single one of these, they were glycol racks. Every single one of these had the worst oil levels in them ever. They were Carlisle's. Some of the compressors were chock full at the top. Some of them were empty, no levels in the temp rights, and. We went through, reset all the reset all the uh, oil floats. We changed the suction filters. We fixed the cycling issues. We floated the suction pressure up. And I'm not even kidding you. The one day, I spent like an hour and a half draining oil, and then I came back another hour later. Drained. I drained out like 11 gallons of oil out of the rack. Just just from fixing a few things. That's how much oil these other contractors are putting in there. We we had one store. We took uh, two five gallon buckets out of out of a glycol oh, rack. Just this week, I, I I probably drained out a good uh, five and a half gallons. I mean, it's it's that's not that real hard. I mean, like you, know, you have, you know, technicians that don't understand the oil system. Um, it, you know, to be fair, there's are one of the highest callback rates that most technicians have the most problems with because there are so many moving parts. Um, You do have the oil separator. You do have the oil regulating valve. You know, there's so many different things with the system that sometimes it is kind of hard to, you know, nail down really what's going on. So a lot of uneducated uh, technicians out in the field, uh, you know, I just need to add oil. That's, that's what I need to do. That's, you know, the automatic response. I'm actually. The, the, the last thing you should be doing is getting a oil pump and, and, and a gallon of oil out of your truck and adding it. For if sure. it's not on the floor, I'm excited to do the next system. portion of this. Uh, honestly, there's so many, so many oil issues, so many stories I can think of that, that are going to help a lot of different people out there. Um, uh, man, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about this. So one, one other thing I wanted to uh, go over would be, uh, how to identify the separator not feeding. So how I typically look at an oil separator, especially if it's a low pressure, I mean, six to seven times an hour. I mean, do you feel that that's, that's usually what I'm looking that sounds for. Right. Do you feel yeah. that's a pretty I... good feed number, Brett? Yeah. So what I'll end up doing is I'll end up, I'll put a temp clamp on there, you know, maybe like, 10, 12 inches out of the separator where it's cooled off a little bit, I'll put a temp clamp on there and I'll watch it. You know, I'll, I'll have my iPad there or whatever, this recording, and I'll watch it. You should see that spike up a temp when it feeds and then shoot back down when it stops feeding. Spike up a temp, shoot back down. If you're not spiking up at all and it's just hot all the time, the float's stuck. You're going you're gonna to have to man up and drop it. You could, guys are over there kicking them and beating them. I mean, yeah, it may jar something loose, but you're going to have to drop a float, okay? I'd rather be stuck open than stuck closed. It's a lot better, especially on a weekend. If it's not spiking at all, like it's just cool all the time, you're either have a stuck oil float or you're not separating oil. So you're going to have to drop a float to see which one it is. And if it's a stuck oil float, be prepared because you're about to get covered in oil. And I'll tell you this, 
two PSI or one PSI <laughs> is a lot of pressure when it comes to oil. One or two PSI will completely cover you in oil. It's not like, you know, taking off of, you know, a cap at like one pound or two pounds where you're not even going to notice it. But and then one or two PSI with, with it, oil that's already yeah, at least 180 you're, degrees is really bad too. Nothing is worse Start in this job the than van. getting an Start oil van. In the van. <laughs> yeah, spare clothing in the van or, you know, just get the, the oil bath or the mineral oil smell. My kids are constantly, you. Dad, why do you smell like oil all the time? It's only two years. You're not used to it by now. Yeah. I mean, one thing I like to keep my truck, I always keep a flow gasket in my truck. Always. Because I try to keep a float, but I mean, a lot of times there's not much to fail on a float unless the ball fails. I mean, most of the time you could clean a needle in the seat, just float back, flow some degreaser in there and you're, you're good to go. I mean, most of the time they're full, full of crap. If the oil separators fail, which we're going to go into next or the next podcast, we're going to go into details on like how we go about troubleshooting all this stuff and what exactly we look for. But like, this was just a brief overview on. And I do have an awesome works. way to actually back blow the separator to get that thing back up and feeding just for the time being. And so you can get your hands on a float. So you don't have to, you know, cause think about it. If you, if you're not separating the, if you're not getting the oil out of the separator, all your compressors are going to be empty, right? We need a way to get that oil back into our compressors. And like I said, mm-hmm. we'll be going over a detailed description on how to get, that's uh, that separator to start flowing again but i guess that's it for tonight guys 